Hello there, everyone. Take a seat, we're gonna get started. Welcome to Target Free Thursday Night at the Walker Art Center. I'm Sarah Peters, I'm the Associate Director of Public and Interpretive Programs, and I wanna thank you all for coming this evening. I also wanna extend a special welcome to anyone who may be here in the audience from out of town for the National Art Educators Association Conference. Um, yay, um, I hope you enjoy your stay, um, and thank you for um, ending what has already been a long day, I'm sure for you, here with this program. This, um, the reading tonight is the last program in a series of adventures related to an exhibition that is on view upstairs for just a few short remaining days. Um, upstairs in the Medtronic Gallery, it's called Text Messages, Books by Artists, and it's a remarkable collection of works pulled from our library and our permanent collection of books by artists and other book-like objects. And if you haven't had a chance to see it or if you need a return visit before it goes back to the library shelves, um, please take the time to do so. It's really a remarkable exhibition. And it's allowed us to mine a territory that is frequently traversed by artists and writers, which is the collaborative artist book. You'll see many ex examples of that upstairs as well as here this evening. So it's really exciting to have an opportunity to highlight that kind of practice that's frequently used by artists and writers. I want to welcome to the stage Eric Lorber, who is the editor of Rain Taxi Review of Books. And for those of you who don't know or are visiting from far away, Rain Taxi is a local literary magazine with international appeal um, that we are very fortunate to partner with on the free verse series of poetry readings here at the Walker. Um, I want to thank Eric for his curation of tonight's event and for all the work he does for this series. So please welcome Eric. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, um, and it's lovely to see uh, so many of you here on such a beautiful uh, evening. Um, as always, it's a great pleasure to partner with the Walker Arts Center in uh, bringing the art of contemporary literature into the museum, uh, and uh, also want to thank uh, Target Free Thursday Nights for, um, for making it free. Uh, Quite often when we plan these literary events, we uh, try to connect them uh, sometimes a bit obliquely to an exhibition here at the Walker. Uh, in this case, it's not oblique at all. Uh, it was simply a no-brainer when, when we saw that beautiful artist book show to say, let's bring in some poets who have uh, collaborated with artists to create special books. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we've done. Uh, and I think you'll see some great examples tonight. So without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our first poet, Vincent Katz. Uh, Vincent is someone I've admired for many years now uh, for the many hats he wears. Uh, he is, of course, a poet and has published 10 volumes of adroit and energetic verse, many of them collaborations with artists. He also translates poetry from Latin and won the National Translation Award for his work on the complete elegies of Sextus Propertius. In the art world, he's known as a curator, a scholar, and a critic. With his wife, Vivian Bittencourt, he has even made documentary films, including Kiki Smith, Squatting the Palace, and Man in the Woods, The Art of Rudy Burkhart. Somehow, with all this, he still finds time to edit the terrific journal Vanitas, an annual of poetry and art, and the small press libellum books. I'm really delighted he could join us tonight to share his poetry and his views on artist books Please welcome Vincent Katz. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for inviting me to read. And thanks to The Walker. I've always been a fan of The Walker, so it's, it's, it's a real pleasure to come here and do a reading. Um, I'm going to be reading from two different books. Uh, and the first one is Judge collaboration with Wayne Gonzalez, the painter and graphic artist. And um, I'm going to read an excerpt from this book length poem. Um, the way I wrote it was it was when uh, John Roberts was nominated to become a Supreme Court judge, and I was intrigued by that frame. I mean, it was a kind of depressing sense of intrigue, but 
you know when something started and you kind of know what the end result is going to be. But I, anyway, during that time period, I was reading the New York Times and trying to do something with my frustration. So I, every word in this poem comes from the New York Times, but highly edited and compressed. So I was trying to make something musical or lively out of what was coming out of the paper. And then I thought of Wayne because he was doing similar things in his work in which he takes images from the media, usually from the internet, and then transforms them. So here we go. Judge. The opening credits for the show include a montage accompanied by a song. I'm not the same girl you used to know. On the courthouse steps, her daytime show ordered by stations in 98% of the country will celebrate lifestyle empire staged on a set like a runway with enormous kitchen, soundproof nowhere, a library full of live plants with reality television maestro, familiar how-to. An entire audience of women knitted or crocheted the poncho Stuart wore home from, from prison. More than a million downloaded the pattern after seeing her wear it on television. Sweet dreams by the Eurythmics has lyrics perfect for her, he said. The song includes such lines as, everyone is looking for something and I'm gonna know what's inside you. The process shockingly real, the shock the catchphrase she will use to dispatch losing contestants each week tried to downplay a wonderful commonality to the end of every show, the date when the surveillance bracelet will be removed to being released from home confinement, probation inappropriate. He had smoked marijuana in the fall of 1973, the Harvard Young Republican Club. Political posturing, there was no time, could swallow 50 hours a week. Douglas H. Ginsburg, unpolarized aftermath, donut-fueled Gannett House, the conference table, the law review building, impressions, other people's politics, Long Beach Inn, an affluent enclave, Bethlehem Steel, La Lumiere, Catholic boarding near La Porte, hard-working John was politically conservative. He was comfortable with it, but it didn't define his friendships, fit for the cure. Come in for a complimentary fitting in a Waycoll or DKNY bra, and Waycoll will donate $2 to the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation for research and outreach. Buy a Waycoll bra, and Waycoll will donate another $2. Colony, Manhasset, and Monmouth, Willowbrook, Bridgewater, Smith Haven, and Cherry Hill, Herald Square, Garden State Plaza, Short Hills, and Roosevelt Field. Macy's, way to shop. Forged conservative imprint, interim term begins vacancies, terminal illness, named William H. Rehnquist, Justices Hugo Black and John Marshall Harlan, swirling rumors, seriously ill, diagnosed in a sign of mounting anxiety in the Rose Garden before live television. One of the worst, abruptly overhauled, undermined younger days in Houston, his demeanor the magnitude of responding, tremendous problems unacceptable. The president was flanked, scrambled, he was grounded in his beliefs, a staunch defender of an independent judiciary, began his long career on the far right, subsequent appointments, eventually imprint of his gavel deep, now it is cemented forever in our history. I will consult with Chairman Specter. Chemotherapy died without ever discussing standard forms. Linda Greenhouse, muscular use of judicial review into binding national precedent, overturning dozens in the zero-sum institutional enhancement irony, episode of galvanizing divisiveness. I did nothing in particular and I did it very well, he said, borrowing a line from his favorite Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. Obstruction of justice also inspired Chief Justice to modify his basic black judicial robe, adding four gold stripes to each sleeve. The turn of the political wheel would plant a phrase in an opinion that would take root, blossom, and prove even more useful far to the right. 
determination to dismantle appeared far distant. Such liberal titans as William O. Douglas, William J. Brennan, Jr., and Thurgood Marshall. Advocacy from Judicial Conference of the United States, too many procedural obstacles quickened the pace of executions, enhanced police ability to conduct searches. One of two dissenters in Roe v. Wade, short one vote in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, quoting the Civil War poem, Barbara Fritchie, remained a lightning rod, a flat Midwestern accent, his Wisconsin childhood. I believe it is infinity, since when you divide zero into one, the result is infinity. An unsigned opinion held that lack of uniform counting meant recount would violate equal protection. No time to fix the problem, so no further counting. In the secure middle-class household, William Hubbs Rehnquist was born from Sweden, a wholesale broker, conservative Republicans, a weather observer complained to friends about Harvard liberalism. He married, he married a fellow graduate student then working for the Central Intelligence Agency. They had a son, James, and two daughters, Janet and Nancy, spoke against a local law barring racial discrimination, friendly with Richard G. Kleindienst, high profile to monitor and control the protests against the war in Vietnam, the new barbarians, immediacy, and by wrestling, who the hell is that clown? Rehnquist's pink shirt and psychedelic necktie to a racially restrictive covenant on his deed. We're all extremists together, he smiled. It's like the five stages of accepting death. First, I was thinking if I had enough ice to save the good shrimp and tilapia. Then it's whether I can save the house. Now it's about my life. If I had two AKs, I'd feel safe here. As it is, someone could pop me and I'd end up bloated. No one, no one would check for bullet holes. I'd end up in some potter's field. You can feel human life receding like the waters. And this next um, collaboration was done differently and um, uh, shorter, fewer poems and fewer images. Um, had something to do with the time that I spent in Italy. And as I was asked, Francesco Clemente, who's an Italian born artist, to collaborate on this piece, we came up with some ideas that would reflect that experience. The title literally means some cell phones in Italian. I'll, I'll read a few poems from this book. L'amour fou. Jumping on typewriter keys. Dancing in hot proximity. Viscous substance provided. Descends in utter strain. Poem. I could never comprehend the mountains. The snow lay there. And here, the motorcycles. Seeing the lights at night is such comfort. Spring returns to the trees. Nature's war is won again. Man's digs in deeper. I see my own vulnerability in my son, but I also see his beauty. Breath. Histories evened at poetry's end. Seasons for one, which is no one. For bringing forth fruit or children. A quiet amid talking. A bomb fallen to earth to break in pieces. Slow reckoning. A sieve through which time glowing emits faded reliefs. Antique breath halted. Bricks. 
are what it's made of above our head. Look out and see the people across the way. The rain intercedes, but you can always walk. You see through the building to trees. A fluorescent bar hangs over a now empty table. Where have they gone, those innocent, mysterious people? Trees staked against the uncertain, paving stones of diverse dimension, such as painting. Now they're back at the table, talking, gesturing, presumably deciding matters of importance. A vase of red and white flowers enhances their discussion, reflection of roof and sky. The day trundles along. It is not time to get dark yet. Slowly, slowly, the sky is there, reflection, the slanted roofs, scalloped slate, rain comes down on it, and the trees are visible. The tree nearby, its branches curving up and down, decorated with budding green. The trees far away, behind, through the building, branches filling the screen as rectilinear divisions complexly, too. What are those miniature sideways stairs? Drains organized against nature's persistence. The sky still white, the text weighs down on them. Arches and varied squares, a hand of leaves. Dawn, a gray sky, the chant starts, gray but filled with demarcation. A thousand subtle trills, hoots, warblings, the sky is full. Sky. A boy bicycles the cobbled court. A young woman with long red hair joins the bicycling. Circles they describe, touching the lot, and disappear. Then are seen on the other side in the playground, rounding a corner, down the street again. It got lighter for a bit, then settled down again. The air lighter this afternoon, shades of sun settle on buildings as they walk out to the cinema. Broad streets filled with trees, quiet buildings, a drama built from the center's flow of faces. Calm. I do feel comfortable in the sense of not having violated one, une personne physique, or morale, but not as the river with its barges and tugs, concomitant trees and bugs rolls by, calm. I still remember, feel that soft touch I wanted to get. Sun. I go inside and close my eyes. I want to remember it all. The precise feel of distance from there to here, glow of the flowers, every day's light play as sun goes down, bamboo starts to swim in light. Moving, it changes long branches, makes shapes on orange buildings. Details will, es will escape me. Light still licks the tops. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. That was lovely. 
Our next guest tonight is Lewis Warsh. Lewis Warsh has been a noteworthy voice in the cacophony of American poetry since 1965, when he attended the famed Berkeley Poetry Conference and became enlightened, I presume. He became part of the great community of writers that grew up around the poetry project at St. Mark's Church in New York, a community that included Ann Waldman, Ted Berrigan, Bernadette Mayer, Ron Paget, Joe Brainerd, and George Schneeman, among many others. He co-founded two hugely influential small presses, Angel Hair and United Artists, the latter of which is still going strong, and has released numerous volumes of fiction and poetry, all of them containing some of the most rhythmically engaging and lyrically strong lines and sentences you'll ever have the pleasure to read. Fortunately, we'll have the pleasure of hearing those rhythms for ourselves tonight as he presents his 2001 collaboration with video artist Julie Harrison, Debtor's Prison. Reading with Lewis tonight will be our special guest, Constance Llewellyn, curator at the University of California, Berkeley Art Museum. Please welcome Lewis Warsh and Connie Llewellyn. A rock carved by Michelangelo in the form of a snake. Reflections of flora, hard of hearing. The person beside you is breathing in her sleep. Coerce, coerce, harass, harass. Her thoughts are like a series of windows covered with dust. Arable soil, mental picture. My head reaches up to your waist when I stand on my toes. Lunar paraphrase, angelic thread. A woman in high heels beckons from a street corner. White wall, black hole, nothing discernible. The people who stopped loving one another were staring out the window. Zero benchmark, no one but me. You crawled towards me naked across the rug. Shift changes at the main gate. Cast of thousands. Self-discipline is necessary if you want to forget something. No parameters, no parameters. Attachment, detachment, cloud cover, free of pain. My heart touches bottom, my heart touches bottom. He prayed to something beautiful that didn't have a name. Concave backdrop, luna crescent. You, your body, the salt in the air on my tongue. Organic connection, relevant future. Facial blemishes, the taste of the sea on my lips. A dream of loneliness, round glasses with wire frames. The things you say come back to you like spoiled porridge. Paths of snow, no conviction. It seemed like you had never undressed in her presence. Enmeshment of opposites, no one to blame. In the dark, I couldn't tell whether it was her body or his. Suspicions unwarranted, endless embrace. A threat of eviction propels the tenants into the street. It smells like licorice, it smells like licorice. We tend to be attracted to people who look like people we used to love. Statement of intent, human ceiling. Listen to the hum of the woman behind the beaded curtain at the end of the alley. Conscious baptism, paths of snow. In control of nothing but writing and even writing, I'm out of control. Protective custody, screams in the night. I knocked on the bathroom door to see if she was still alive. Academic discourse, unleavened bread. You who crossed the street when you saw me coming. Blind coincidence, nothing to lose. 
We hold on to something by not letting it out of our memory. Coherent sequence. Coherent sequence. Every new person is a messenger, but the message is open to question. The warranty has expired. The warranty has expired. I call the waitress to bring us our check. Manicure, manicure, interference, interference. She listens to what you say and responds accordingly. Dangerous propensity, no one to blame. The men's room, a parking lot, her face in the rear view mirror. Negative dependency, start over and tell the truth. He touched the door of the, he locked the door of the castle and threw away the key. Dusty carapace, the wrong end of the spectrum. The leading lady was poisoned by her understudy. Girlish harmonies, puzzled stars. Empty hangers in the closet, the world keeps spinning. Yes for happiness, no for truth. A person I never saw before calling my name. Displaced accent, reliable buffer. Jealousy and possessiveness are things of the past. Biblical exegesis, indecipherable memory. A list of samples drops like wax from the tip of my thumb. Profit equals loss, ruthless creditor. A tiny speedboat bouncing over choppy waves. Brightness of yearning, a rivulet at the curb's edge. Another person is always responding to what you say. Debtor's prison, debtor's prison. A long way from exactitude, but hard of hearing. Eat without swallowing. Nothing to lose. Listen to the scratchy record of the men smoking in the alley. Footnote to Plato, blind conviction. If you ask me nicely, I'll tell you the truth. Still, as in still life, an animal like me. The word is still the thing we must go on weeping. Nasty customer, nasty customer. The weather lady caved into pressure to remove her dress. Passing reference, passing reference. Listen to the sound of the snow falling on the debris in the alley. Inaugural sunrise, inaugural sunrise. An usher leads us down the aisle with a flashlight. Displaced accent, furtive gaze. I was thinking of you in a different context. I said your name in my sleep. No questions asked, no questions asked. I hid my head in the muddy ground, but no one noticed. Redwood bar stool, bouffant hairdo. Back the car into a ditch when no one was looking. Line of demarcation, nothing to lose. It's possible to wear the same clothing as the person who died. Dusty carapace. Plaintive morning. There's only one way this void can be filled, and that's by putting words on paper. Footsteps on the ceiling, swollen gland. Perhaps there's an island in the Pacific that hasn't been invaded by our unhappiness. Voice of conscience, no longer visible. You can read the sentence backwards, and it still means the same thing. Surgical intervention. Mental picture. I woke up with your name on my lips. I see precipice, I see precipice. The expression on my face changes depending on my mood. Elixir of immortality, essence of life. It's almost Wednesday and I'm free of words. Solitary confinement, awkward embrace. That's it, That's thank it. you. <laughs> Thank you, Lewis, and thank you, Connie. Our final uh, reader tonight, before we have a brief uh, discussion about these books, is Bill Berkson. Bill Berkson has been active in the art and literary worlds since the late 50s. As an art critic, he is well known for his contributions to the journals Art News, Art Forum, and Art in America, where he wrote extensively about seemingly all the major artists of our time. 
His criticism has been collected in books such as The Sweet Singer of Modernism and Sudden Address, Selected Lectures. Yet Bill Berkson has also given us five decades of a bold and exuberant poetry, originally published in small press volumes such as Blue is the Hero, Fugue State, and Our Friends Will Pass Among You Silently. Often ekphrastic, Bill's poetry seems to me more like paintings than about them, made up of light, color, texture, and line. A volume of new and selected poems titled Portrait and Dream, which has just been published by Minnesota's own Coffeehouse Press, will I think encourage a long overdue assessment of his terrific body of work. Tonight he'll present some poems that appear in Portrait and Dream, but that originally were showcased in the 2005 artist book Gloria with etchings by Alex Katz. Please welcome Bill Berkson. Well, we got, <laughs> yes. Thanks a lot, Eric. Um, yes, this book, Gloria, uh, with etchings by Alex Katz, was begun in 2004 and uh, completed in 2005 as in the production. And uh, more about that later, I guess, when we all sit down. Um, this is the outside and the spine. and. So I'm gonna go through it and uh, uh, it's a, um, I don't remember how many poems are in this book, but, but I can't read all of them and uh, let you survive. So <laughs> uh, I'm choosing extreme patience of those who believing the world would end that day assembled on one member's front porch and sat waiting in the event that this should occur it hasn't, and at sunset they get back up and disperse to separate houses until called when next to witness such desirable oblivion. Signature song. Bunny Berrigan first recorded I Can't Get Started with a small group that included Joe Bushkin, Cozy Cole, and Artie Shaw in 1936. Earlier that same year, the song, written by Ira Gershwin and Vernon Duke and rendered as a duet pattern number by Bob Hope and Eve Arden, made its debut on Broadway in the Ziegfeld Follies. By 1937, when Berrigan re-recorded it in a big band setting, I Can't, had become his signature song, even though within a few months, Billie Holiday would record her astonishing version backed by Lester Young and the rest of the Basie Orchestra. Lovers for a time, Lee Wiley and Berrigan began appearing together on Wiley's 15-minute CBS radio spot, Saturday Night Swing Club in 1936. Berrigan died from alcoholism-related causes on June 2, 1942. Although I Can't Get Started is perfectly suited to Wiley's deep phrasing and succinct vibrato, she recorded the ballad only once, informally, in 1944, during a Los Angeles club date. The, civil, the Spanish Civil War started in 1936 and ended in 1939, with Generalissimo Francisco Franco's forces entering Madrid. I've settled revolutions in Spain, goes Gershwin's lyric, equally odd. Cheap seats. On the telephone answering machine, a sly recorder rendition of Be It Ever So Humble, There's No Place Like Home. Similarly, heard at the gym, a country western singer describing the girl of his dreams as Picasso-esque. Once light bounced on the nearby wave, now it is riddled with troughs. Nope, you are none the wiser, even though the crime is solved, the brat smirks. Hmm. Hmm. I think 
forget to go back. Precipitous. Never happened. Fatal business near poems, virtual, virtual fatalities, no gloom intended. But see and say, morning clouds burning off before noon. Birds fly in a family of bird life listed along the chart of the sky. Where else would sky be but all around each peculiar bird, all optimizing ways of being themselves? The rest of us inhabiting our typical morass together, trading sores, consciousnesses, death underwater, 18 men in a Russian tub. Last look. Why call it an exit if it spins? Weary of circa, plunge I take, Chardin's wife, mortal at her tea. Take, taste, sully your fork. Troublemaker once loved, shot his glance, rubric on shadow, undifferentiated slices of the thinner onion. English sweet. I refuse to take Glenn Gould seriously, she said. But I corrected her. Not only is Glenn Gould serious, but he is seriously funny. The stony silence that followed saddened me deeply. I'm sorry it turned out this way, our hostess said as we went upstairs. She said, it's like learning to tell time in a foreign country. You got a problem with that? A calcium deposit in deep recesses puts its chilly finger on the issue. You neither move nor glow. She's fumbling with the zipper. No zipper. The platform proffers a Tuscan sunset together with petty theft. The time sky does a light faint. Regency. The Louvre has the best collection. He died at the Louvre. Still lives and genre scenes in a steamer trunk bound for Boca Raton. Meanwhile, at the École Pratique des Hautes Etudes, I have to write something understated about how ideas about art or what life does or won't do, clear or not, tend to be lifelike, absurd, or preposterous. Of days among the living, these were the most teeming with aura of air and purpose. Between prophecies, we should prefer a glass bottom boat. Merit. Sorry for the suffering world reaper of sutures in point of other surface beneath the silly sheets. What conditions lack is truth in the absence of conditions, same blank din, soon to be released. Oh boy, oh boy, the color of your knowing this when you do. Tramping through the snow to see the pictures cleanly made by this year's nut. Um, this sequence uh, uh, appears, as you will see it, on three page spreads in Gloria, but it was um, um, uh, reprinted in an, in an anthology of uh, poems and, and, and pictures called New York uh, Work uh, Pictures by Alex Katz, uh, which I believe was edited by Vincent, and Vincent very brightly went right ahead and rearranged the sequence uh, perfectly so that uh, now that's the way it goes. It, it needed rearranging and I hadn't realized it. Six epigrams. 
The anointed hour, the graces came to my door too, green bronze next to yellow enamel mounted over rows of well-weathered cedar shingles. I've got to go out for a while, I told them. Make yourselves at home. Among the crinolines, a champagne bubble from the 1950s in the air still. What that champagne felt, experienced, never forgot, deemed significant. When you cried, its other bubbles burst. Friends, my friends are ascending, inadvertently occupying positions of importance in the contemporary pantheon. Destiny does things like that. The rose shimmies with enjoyment over itself. Reimagined re episode. Snack wrappers crinkling down the aisles. Cabin pressure dropping in the lap of the gods. Flushing meadows. Oh yes, so it goes something, well, it's, it's different, that's all. You're just going to have to put up with it. <laughs> A lady at her writing table. I chose love and friendship over work, then work and friendship over suspended disbelief. Won't love conquer all? I'll never work again. Don't call me. And uh, plot. There's always a pretty girl in the plot, but nowadays she calls me sir. Song for Connie, that is the same Connie who was standing here minutes ago. You'll see why. <laughs> the sun met the moon at the corner, noon in thin melt air, big commotion you later choose to notice. Love shapes the heart that once was pieces. You take it in hand, the heart in mind. Your fate's consistent alongside mine, unless a mess. Your best guess, that is right, thanks. The intimate fact that you elect it at corners dressed or naked, dark with lips taste full body, time thick or fixated. Love take heart as heart takes shape, as recognition ceases thinly to be obscure. One line down the center, Another flying outward enters. Heine song. This is a loose translation of a, of a poem of Heinrich Heine's in German, which was used in a song cycle uh, by Robert, Robert Schumann. The rose, the lily, the dove, the sun, I love them all in love's mad swoon. I love them no more. I love only one, the fine one, lithe one, pure and true, self-same source of all love's flows, lily, dove, sun, and rose. Uh, two more. Tango. Maybe we need another word for nature. Would chaos do? Largely friendly, lately it has been a confidant right up there with actuality. Another word that insists on being. All leaves and unfigureoutable turnings. A fork holds up the air sky. Its trident mirror image jabs over e eons into the deep dark snuggle. That wanderer's length is a bird-colored click on deliquescence. Shave off the finer hairs you might find a face, dismissive of skepticism, an opaque residue, 
where fibers lunch on circular bugs or vice versa, affinity, figure and ground, coterminous with a sapling dressed to the nines to dissemble, launching a lecture or panel discussion on troubled paradise. Lightning strikes but once as ever from the ground up. I like to sit in its lap. The stellar urgency of this life, <clears throat> actual in less than date and time. And the last poem in the book is the, the title poem, uh, Gloria, which was written um, in December uh, 2001. Um, on the spot. A large US flag flaps loudly outside our dining room, suspended on a pole from the topmost balcony across the way. I keep taking it for some poor thug running through the late September night, sneakers smacking. Oh, I didn't go there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, what we're gonna do now is uh, have a brief uh, sort of round table discussion and uh, grill our three poets about how they came to make these books with uh, these artists and uh, also maybe talk about some of the artists, other artists they, they've worked with and uh, some of the dynamics of this kind of collaboration. Uh, afterwards, of course, uh, we'll be out, I'll be out in the lo lobby for uh, a book signing. You probably saw that books by all three poets are available for sale thanks to the Walker Bookshop. Uh, so here we go. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all again for th these presentations. Um, and uh, uh, let me start with an easy question. Uh, Vincent told us a little bit uh, about his uh, collaborations, but how did, how did uh, uh, tell us more deeply how these collaborations actually uh, came about? Um, Steve Clay of Granary Books asked, <laughs> Shall I start again? Steve Clay of Granary Books um, asked me if I would do a collaboration with his wife, Julie Harrison, who's a video artist. Um, and of course I said yes. Um, and Julie was interested in doing this. And um, so what she did, what you saw up there, were stills from her various videos. Um, and <laughs> so we ar arranged all these stills on the floor of her studio. Um, and for a long time I had been writing these poems that consisted of one line or one declarative sentence or um, one observation. Um, and I thought um, in some kind of minimalist way to have that facing Julie's image. Um, and then I thought, well, I should add something else that it seemed too minimal. Um, and so I had this little other voice coming at it, um, sort of offsetting um, the one-liner um, in a sort of call and response of some kind, or in my fantasy, that, that's what it was. Um, um, so as you saw, each facing each of Julie's stills, um, there is one of these statements, and then one added little response. Um, and then we somehow matched them. So I wrote a lot of them, and um, and then I looked at her stills again, and I tried to sort of, we both together tried to see which matched up. Um, and some of them did in a, maybe a kind of literal way, and others in um, using, I think the word you use, in a more oblique way, um, and others probably not at all. Um, but it seemed, the not at all seemed interesting as well. Um, why not? Um, and that's how we did it. And then Steve Clay published the book 
for Granary. Um, and there we were. And, and how about the, the format? Um, I should say that uh, one of the great things about artist books is that they do come in such a wide range of formats. Some of the work uh, we saw tonight was a uh, very fine press, uh, uh, rare and, and uh, uh, letterpress hand printed and so forth. Uh, some of the kind of work that you see in the exhibit uh, that only a, a few copies are made and, and most of those are in museums. Uh, others are created as uh, books for the reader, uh, books that you can actually purchase um, outside, uh, even if you're not a major art museum. Uh, so how about the format? Was, was that part of the discussion? Um, absolutely. It was Steve Clay, um, who also published Vincent's collaboration with Francesco Clemente, um, is a person who's involved in making books, and that's what he does. And um, He does some books. I mean, he did this in an, I think an edition of like a thousand copies. Um, and then he does other books in very limited editions, as we know. Um, but he's interested in this physical object called the book. Um, that's what he does. That's what it's all about for him. Um, and yes, the three of us collaborated certainly on the way this book was gonna look. Um, and it seemed this small, since my, my contribution was again this minimalist, this one line text, two, two line text, um, it wasn't gonna be a huge, you know, 12 by 18 book, it was gonna be a smaller book. Um, and so that was certainly what determined it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and how about, how about you, Bill, for, how did you work with Alex on this book? Um, cross country. <laughs> uh, work, uh, uh, really, oh, the work was. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're, this living room, living room setting <laughs> is working against us here. We're feeling very relaxed. Uh, um, uh, I didn't see Alex at all. It's sort of like that uh, Herbert Marshall line. Uh, you know, uh, I want to see the moon in that champagne, and I don't want to see you at all. But it wasn't that I didn't want to see Alex, it was just that he was in New York and I was in San Francisco and this was happening over 2004 or 5. Uh, what happened was that Andrew Hoyam, uh, the publisher of uh, Aryan Press, which does fine books in, uh, in the tradition, I think he probably feels, of a, a long tradition of San Francisco fine printing and book design, um, was teaching a uh, a class in bookmaking at the San Francisco Art Institute where I taught for many years. And originally his idea was to make, uh, he, a he asked me for a group of poems that his students could work with. Hmm. And then he changed his mind and then he thought, no, this will uh, be a real Aryan Press book and I want to get uh, a an artist of a certain experience, caliber to, to work on it. And eventually that person was, was Alex. And uh, uh, so we both talked with Alex about it and I sent Alex a manuscript and he provided the etchings. Um, he wanted the etchings to be produced at a workshop in New England where he's worked for many years. He's very specific about what he wanted yeah. and format and so forth. He really dictated a lot of what, what happened. Also, um, it was strange in a way of collaboration because he did the etchings and they were in some way responses to the manuscript, but not to individual poems, which he, so he then said, and this is very, very unusual. He then said, uh, uh, you know, you, you figure out how the, po how the images go with the poems. Hmm. And I said, well, Andrew, you try it. <laughs> it's a lot of and passing And actually, the buck he, did, he, <laughs> he did, he did, he did, so then about a month later, he said, okay, I think I've got it. And um, I went over to look at it, and it was sort of like, not that facing that, cause that's too literal, let's put that over here. We made about three changes, mm -hmm. and uh, that was it. And uh, uh, Andrew, I think, as you could tell, or, or one of the people who works with him came up with the cover, which has a kind of almost hummingbird fluorescent uh, mm -hmm. uh, or iridescent lettering. Uh, that wasn't Alex at all, but mm -hmm. it was, you know, uh, and so that was it. That's great. Well, as I think we're hearing, sometimes the art 
drives the writing, sometimes the writing drives the art. What about you, Vincent? You have actually two, two stories to tell us. Um, yeah, well, I've collaborated a number of times and in, in different ways, and I think one of the interesting things and one that draws me to collaboration is the opportunity to spend some time with somebody. So it's interesting to hear that story of collaborating cross-country. Um, but there are many different ways to collaborate, of course. Um, so with these two books that you saw, uh, Judge was something that uh, I had worked with that publisher before, and I kind of co-designed a book with my wife, who's um, a photographer, a previous book with that publisher. So I think he felt a little bit comfortable with me, and I said that, we wanted to, Wayne Gonzalez and I would like to design this book because I had always wanted to see what would happen if text could really become enmeshed with visual work. Oftentimes it's separate or there's a little bit of overlap. Um, but with this particular project being about the media and the overload of media, uh, there are a number of things in the book where there's, there's text that goes off the page, there's text that's heavily layered with the image so that it's almost illegible. I mean, we worked very hard to, and it's always, you, there's always that point where you can't really predict what the final result is gonna be, even with the proof, you try to go there, but, um, so there were some times when we tried to get the text almost illegible, but that you could read it, actually. So it was a long and actually very enjoyable process of working together um, on the computer. There was a lot of text. A lot of text, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but so we did that together, you know, kind of many hours of, of moving things back and forth and trying different things in terms of design. The other project was a little bit more like, like the process Bill described with Alex um, in that I had written all these poems and I showed them to Francesco. I said, you know, maybe you like to do something with this. <laughs> and, and Francesco is interesting. It's, we, he once said to Steve, Steve said that this Steve Clay of Granary Books, he said, when it was all done, he said, you know, I have to tell you, there was a certain point where I despaired of this books ever seeing the light of day because this, is, this took the longest of any Granary book I've ever done. <laughs> and I, I remember months would go by, I don't know, Francesco travels a lot, but it's not just that. It's a time use of how people use time and take time to, to do their work. And I remember Francesco once said to Steve, you know, we're both very slow and you're slower, so we're all gonna be okay. <laughs> but it was a little bit like that. I gave him the poems and it seems like years later, I mean, maybe it was only two years, but a long time, he came back from the summer with this suite of watercolors that were like commentaries on the poems. They really respond to the poems. Mm -hmm. And then, then there was a different process because as Lewis said, Steve Clay is a book man and so it was this idea of how do you get this stuff into the right format and that took a very long time. And Steve, I mean we commented and had input but Steve was basically the one who figured that out and it was not easy. And, and how was the lettering of the poems done for those images? That was another one of those things. I, I have this memory which no one else remembers of somebody saying, I think it was Steve saying, oh, it'd be great if the whole book was hand lettered. So I have to tell a little, a quick little anecdote here about that because, okay, so I said, okay, that's great. That's, I like to letter, let's do that. So I lettered all the poems and there are many more poems than are in this book. And Francesco said, okay, so do it on this. This is the paper, it's, he talks like this. It's this size of paper and you get this paper <laughs> and you do all the poems on this paper and then it will be the same size as the artwork. So I said, okay, fine. So I did. I don't know, let's say 60, poem, 60 pages. It takes a long time, very difficult. And then he comes back with the watercolors and I'm like, whoa, Francesco, they're so amazingly beautiful. And they're on a different size paper. <laughs> He's like, oh, did I do them on a different paper? <laughs> and then Steve and I are like, no problem. You know, we'll scan them, we'll, we'll change the size. And Francesco's, no, I don't think that will work. <laughs> You're going to have to write them all over again, <laughs> which he was right. It, did, it wouldn't have worked to change it by scanning and enlarging. 
Um, so there was that involved. But it was, oh. you know, enjoyable. It was a discipline, kind of like a Zen monk. <laughs> Illuminated <laughs> manuscript. <laughs> Try to be clear. They don't call poetry a labor of love for nothing. Well, you're uh, kind of predicting uh, uh, some of my next question. Um, uh, you know, I think we can sense the camaraderie and, and uh, uh, affection that, com that can come with collaboration, but I'm wondering if there were challenges as well or moments of not seeing eye to eye that maybe led to a, you know, what Burroughs called the third mind, you know. Um, well, I think I could say that the, the, the publisher and the artist stopped speaking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and I was sort of out there on the moon or, in, you know, made sure I was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there were some difficult moments in, 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 in the production, you know. But uh, otherwise, you know, not 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 between the two arts. Yeah. You know, and also, also I was, uh, oh, I would like to. Uh, so you're right. <laughs> the Tony Bennett style. Uh, um, I I prefer. I think most of us do prefer the integration uh, of of the text and image. Um, you know, where where the the poem the poem is on the same page. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best. That uh, uh, when that happens, you know, um, but it can work the other way. The face-off. Most of the the books that I've done have been uh, with facing, you know, an image facing a poem. Mm -hmm. But uh, most of the collaborations that I've done, not in books, mm -hmm. uh, like with George Schneeman or uh, Joe Brainerd uh, and um, some others, Michael Goldberg, uh, have been uh, embedded. Mm -hmm. When you say not in books, you mean they're... Poem pictures, they're uh, sometimes called. Meant to be uh, displayed Gustin's, on the wall. Uh, Philip, so Philip yeah. Gustin's another. Though it was never hands-on with Gustin. With Gustin, it would be, mm -hmm. he would choose a poem and incorporate it into a drawing. Mm -hmm. But with uh, George Schneeman, uh, all of us, have you, did you ever work with George? Well, certainly Lewis and I did. Uh, you know, we'd go into George's studio and... and uh, and sometimes there would be five or six people at once scribbling away on poster board, silk screen, whatever came to hand, whatever mm -hmm. George had, and, and uh, you know, it would be all word and image jumbled together wonderfully. Mm -hmm. It helps, I think, if you're in the same city uh, as your collaborator, or in the same <laughs> proximity, right, um, as I was with with Julie Harrison and with Steve, the publisher, um, and we lived literally 10 minutes from each other. Um, so it was, it all happened pretty fast um, and repeated visits mainly to her studio and, and me sending her texts and um, it just all happened and we're old friends and um, so the chance for a misunderstanding was um, what, what was her response that. to the what you had written? Uh -huh. um, she was happy with it, and I mean, we just pretty much. I told her what I was planning to do. Um, I have some regrets. Um, if I have a regret with this book, is that I wish I had written a little more. Um, I guess years later, this one has this thought um, <laughs> that I go, you know, because I can read this book. It takes how long to read? Ten minutes to read, you know. And um, so, if you're a, a reader um, who might well, want to spend a little more time with a book, um, it gives the the experience is too small. Or, or in retrospect, I could have written a few a paragraph accompanying each of... <laughs> a novel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a little, or have a narrative, have some uh, kind of hidden narrative going on. Um, There's something happening in a bathtub there that... <laughs> <laughs> because, well, her images, possibly I wasn't making full use of her images, which are kind of provocative on, on some level. Um, yes, so um, that's my only thought, but um, we've never really talked about doing it again, right, when I can do it again. Um, so it's there, what's there, and kind of we're all happy with it. Yeah. I think we're all happy with it. Well, good, we're happy with it too. I think we should take some questions from the audience, if you have some. I sort of can't quite see, but, oh, and we have, if you well, one, want one, to One add, thing I should add just qu quickly is, uh, there's work by Clemente upstairs in the show, 
Yeah, and uh, not uh, and other books of Aryan Press, John Baldessari's Tristram Shandy, which is one of the very great books in a sort of separate vitrine, and I think Jim Dine and some other people that 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 press were, so that there are you know you can see you can compare and contrast, if you like. Yes, absolutely. I'm I'm assuming many of you will have seen that beautiful artist book show, um, and it closes this weekend. So if you haven't seen it, um, treat yourself to it. Uh, if you ha if you have a question, we have mic um, ushers with microphones uh, so that your question can be captured for the uh, internet and other forms of digital posterity. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit, all of you mentioned Steve Clay, and uh, I know about Steve some, but I think it would be, for some people who don't, I think Steve Clay and Granary would really be of interest to a lot of people in the audience, just how important Granary has been, and Steve, who's, you know, from here also. Who's from, well, he's from the Midwest, but he lived in, in Minneapolis for many years. Um, um, I don't know if he was doing books here at that point. I don't think so. Um, but he came to New York in the 80, 1980s. Um, the first time I met him was at a, he had a reading series he was curating. Um, um, and then he, I mean, he's a person who's just been so supportive uh, um, of what I've been doing. Um, he was the editor, he's the publisher of this anthology I did uh, with Ann Waldman of Angel Hair Magazine and Books, um, which we did in the 1960s and 1970s, and um, he published a 600-page anthology um, of this book, um, sort of recovering a lot of works that hadn't been reprinted. Um, um, the first time I really met him, he came over to my house, um, um, and he pulled a lot of books off my shelf. And I didn't have any money. Um, I needed some money. Um, he said, I'm going to sell all these books. I can sell all these books. I said, Steve, you know, what are you doing? Um, um, <laughs> and then he took away about 300 books. Um, um, I don't know, should I be telling all this? <laughs> um, um, and he printed a little catalog, and he sold them all. Um, um, and then he said, I don't know if this is a apropos to the artist books, but you asked specifically about Steve Clay, right? Um, <laughs> what, what do you want to know about him? Um, he's an enthusiast. I mean, he really, um, he acts as agent for many people's archives. He sells their archives, their literary archives, um, and um, as well as doing books, and he has sold many things of, by people who need money. Um, um, somehow he does it um, in a beautiful way, alongside his his book publishing, right? So he's a person of, <laughs> who does a <laughs> lot of things in the service of, of the impoverished um, <laughs> poets out there. Um, you so poor dear. I guess I should shut up. Um, um, he's, also, he's also done all these books about, you know, uh, poet-artist uh, collaboration as well as, you know, uh, I mean, the, uh, he, he, he published the catalog of the Joe Brainerd uh, uh, exhibition, uh, that Connie curated, uh, which was the first major publication to uh, make uh, any sign of uh, the extent of Brainerd's work. He published a wonderful book called uh, uh, Painter Among Poets, uh, the Collaborative Art of George Schneeman, uh, which is you know the first uh, sign of that, really, uh, for a wide public. Um, he did a book that, I think, Eric and I remarked that, both remarked that uh, it, it could very well be in that sort of reading shelf upstairs called A Secret Location, which is really the history of the remarkable uh, kind of underground or very independent uh, uh, poetry publishing scene, uh, mostly in New York. The title comes from Ed Sanders, published from A Secret Location on the Lower East Side and met many of those publications involved artistic collaboration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's been uh, really uh, 
on the mark in, in, in terms of, uh, of making clear the history of that kind of collaboration and then furthering it like with these books. I've never worked with him directly uh, uh, on any of these books, but I certainly admire what he does. He's a, and I've worked with him now on about four or five different projects and it's just pure pleasure. Um, um, and because he's not a, I guess people people do what they do um, well, and um, though he's not a poet himself or an artist himself in that sense, he's he's created his own space where he does this beautiful artwork, um, um, and it's possible to create that type of space. And he's a very unusual character in that unusual person in that sense. Um, Am I answering, are we answering your question? Yes, yes. Um, well, enough about Kudos to Steve Clay, and kudos to him. We wouldn't be sitting here if not for him on some level, so, um, or I wouldn't be. Um. Any other uh, questions? So Bill and, and Lewis, you both specifically mentioned George Schneeman. Would you mind talking a little bit about, you know, career collaboration with him or, or then specifically about collaboration from those artists who are kind of serial poet collaborators, I guess? Maybe, maybe you should, since <laughs> I don't have much. part of the family. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'm not even going to ask how many people here know anything about George Schneeman's art. It's not like a, uh, uh, you know, sort of... Um, widespread uh, recognition, uh, partly because he kept uh, it, uh, uh, you know, uh, which you could call a generous secret. In, um, but he's from here, born in St. Paul, grew up here, went to college, I forget the name, of St. St. Mary's? St. Mary's, St. Mary's. And uh, 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 very unfortunately uh, uh, died in, in uh, January of this year, and uh, at, at age 74, and had had a great great life, and has a wonderful family that lives here. He came to live in New York in the in the late 60s, in 1967. I think Lewis knew him before uh, I did, and. Um, uh, eventually settled uh, on St. Mark's Place, which was the hub of all kinds of activity uh, at the time. Uh, but he managed to make a kind of a, you could almost say, a small town life in the midst of all this sort of freaky deaky <laughs> 60s activity on St. Mark's Place, uh, which we all benefited from. Uh, 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 his, his, his home was uh, in a sense our clubhouse and uh, 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 and our second home, and uh, part of what happened there, aside from playing poker and eating dinner, was to retire to the studio. As I say, sometimes you know more than just one poet or friend or whatever, and George, but sometimes crowds, as it turned out around 1969, 70, 70. Uh, and uh, I'd make these collaborations, what we'll, we'll got to be called works, <laughs> and let's do some works. And uh, it was all very impromptu, and all very as this kind of collaboration should be. Uh, you know, it's not like where a publisher comes along and says, why don't you two work together? There was nobody prompting it, there was no commission. Mm -hmm. It was an extension of uh, uh, our lives together, called social life. And um, that's, you know, it's a, it's a form of collaboration that I call hands-on. That is where one or more people in the same room at the same time are working on the same surface together. And uh, he, you know, maybe permitted the most, uh, um, the greatest elaboration of that of that form, which I think actually started with Frank O'Hara and Larry Rivers when they did Stones. They worked on a series of etchings together. I don't think anybody had done that kind of, you know, well, what are we going to do here? And sort of, well, you put an image over there. Okay, now I'll put a word here. What are you going to do about that? 
Yeah. <laughs> George also um, was a, a different type of collaborator in that he became the person when we called up whenever we needed a cover for a poetry book um, that we were doing. Um, and so while I was doing Angel Hair books, he probably did about 20 covers um, over a period of a few years. He did possibly three covers that I'm thinking of um, for books of my own. Um, and this is just me, um, 20 covers, 25 covers. Um, you know, he just did, there were multiple independent publishers at that time. I'm talking the 60s and 70s. And, um, and poetry worked, flyer, reading flyers. And flyers for readings. Um, so um, from this household that Bill is describing, um, a lot of art was generated by this one, literally by this one person. Um, um, and it's great. And um, in the book, um, certainly in the Angel Hair Anthology that we were talking about that Steve Clay published, um, there's many, there are covers of all the Angel Hair books and half of them are by George. Um, it's really fun to see them. They're all reproduced in the back of this book. Um, so, what can one say? Well, yeah. there are also paintings, large and small, and ceramics, and floating <laughs> around the planet. Yes. Silk screens, and he made calendars for his friends every year, starting in, I don't know, 67 or so, I think. What did I leave out? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, it, it suggests, too, that there's a real spectrum of collaboration from the kind of social uh, element you're talking about to the more formal, let's make an object, uh, uh, or let's have a plan, maybe. Uh, what, do you find yourself seeking out one style over another, or is it dumb luck? Or Well, I think partly it's that, uh, um, you know, at, uh, at a certain point, um, people disperse and part of that is about getting older and about family living and geography and all kinds of things you know the, the, actually I think that there was a lull um, in that kind of collaboration in the um, well, maybe starting in the, in, in the 70s in the later 70s and then through the 80s and then it picked up again and it picked up again with George uh, uh, we did a lot of collaborating. Anytime I went to New York, we did something together, you know, in the studio. And, um, uh, and so did uh, Ann Waldman and Alice Notley and Ron Padgett and Larry Fagan. Everybody was still doing it, you know. But a lot of it just got to be dispersed and, and uh, the, with, with the, most of the younger uh, or the later artists, the artists who appeared in the 80s, it was usually not that kind of, uh, you know, it wasn't that sort of neighborhood feeling, so it was more commissions, right? I mean, there's like formal pr propositions. Uh, uh, well, I think that's that, true that um, in general. There's a piece upstairs I, I was saying in that exhibition that I remember when it was published, the Whitney Museum did this series of collaborative books, and it's, it's actually a really great story by Stephen King. It's not a horror story. It's a story about how time starts going faster when you get older. And it's a collaboration with Barbara Kruger. But I think that was, as you're describing, something where these two artworks were put together, the story and the visual art. Um, I think with Francesco, it's a little bit different because he's somebody who always read poetry and was passionate about poetry in Italy. And then when he came to New York City, uh, he, through Henry Geldseller, he met Raymond Foy. And, um, and, and Raymond was telling the story the other day. They called up Francesca and said, would you like to, we're having dinner with Allen Ginsberg, would you like to meet Allen Ginsberg? And so he said they took them a little while, Francesco and his wife Alba, to get there because they got all dressed up. They were very, <laughs> honored and excited to meet Allen Ginsberg. And then the next day, Ginsberg went to Francesco's studio and they did a collaboration then. So he was somebody who, in a different way, in a different time period, in a different social setting, but worked with John Wieners and with Gregory Corso and with Robert Creeley and had a lot of social interaction with them. And with you. 
and with me yeah. later. I mean, that's one, one part of it is the interesting thing that, for instance, George Neiman was a, a great reader of poetry and read, uh, he had done a, a thesis, I think, on Ezra Pound at St. Mary's. And, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, um, I don't, uh, I, that thing sort of comes and goes. It's not as prevalent now. But uh, Alex Katz has always uh, read and had very strong opinions about uh, uh, poets and always been very much connected with them. I and mean, done he, portraits of them. And portraits in fact, there's a table right. of a, kind of a cocktail yeah. party that both yeah. of you are in, as well as other poets of your And there's also a series called Faces Friends. of the Poet. Yes. Yeah. Just a comment about the, the book that Vincent is talking about in the exhibition that uh, is a collaboration between Barbara Kruger and Stephen King. It strikes me that a story about time going faster when you get older is a horror story. But <laughs> Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yes. First of all, thank you so much for the readings tonight. Um, they were beautiful to hear. Uh, I have a question about art curation, actually, um, because it's very obvious you all have a lot of experience with it. Um, especially you, Vincent, but it seems that all three of you either know a curator, um, maybe even used one in your presentation tonight. Um, I was just wondering how your experiences with art curation, um, as far as the cataloging and just kind of the strategic selection of different pieces of visual art has influenced your written poetry, um, and specifically with the collaborations tonight or just in general. Um. Well, I think you know, Frank O'Hara has a poem in which he called himself the balayeur des artistes, or the sweeper up after artists in their studio, kind of. And he, that, and then Irving Sandler used that phrase, well, it referred to Sandler too in the poem, but um, the line is, and Irving Sandler continues to be the balayeur des artistes, and so do I. Um, so there's a long tradition of that, you know, of, of poets who have been drawn to artists and, and I think get their air. I mean, that's how I think of it. I, mean, I need to see art. It's something that I need to, to do. And curating is an extension of that. It's, a, it's an opportunity to respect the work and, and all that that means in cataloging and studying and analyzing the artist's motivations. Um, I curated an exhibition on Black Mountain College, which had a large component of manuscripts and books and photographs of poets, by, particularly by Jonathan Williams, um, who did great portraits of Robert Creeley and others. So I don't know, you know, then, but your question was really how is, has curating influenced my poetry? And that, I'm not sure how to answer that exactly. I just think it's the opportunity to be around artists and to learn from them. I don't think, um, I don't know, does curating mean publishing? Um, yes. Uh, yes, uh. one can say <laughs> that. I always think of it as deciding what's going to be on the walls of a gallery or a museum. Um, so you decide what's going to be on the walls of a magazine or a book. Or I mean, a book. I just want to say that you know one of the reasons I got into publishing was the example of these two and others, but particularly Angel Hair and Big Sky were, were two of the publications in the, Big Sky was Bill Berkson's magazine um, that, that just had such an influence on me in, in every way. And what you're going you know, to talk about is the selection of work, but also the, the visual display. No, we started doing, when I started doing Angel Hair, um, which was in, I hate to date myself, the mid-1960s, um, part of the idea was to um, do these books, and at that, that point mm -hmm. the technology was um, mimeographing on some level, because um, remember the mimeograph machine existed, and there were no computers, no such word as computer, um, and... Um, <laughs> Um, we'd run off these books on the mimeograph machine and um, type stencils, these things called stencils, and um, have collating parties. Have collating parties <laughs> where people would walk around tables picking up pieces of paper, right? And, and, and stone. And somebody's <laughs> table. 
um, these parties were, as again, collaborative on some level. People yeah. met their husbands and wives at these parties um, in some <laughs> cases. Um, um, I lost it. But part of the idea was to have covers, um, to have artwork involved. Um, um, and that was really a strong element. And as Bill was saying, who were the artists who were interested in the poets? Um, that always was the question, and certainly George and Joe Brainerd and Alex Katz and Philip Gustin, who um, was a very generous artist, um, who always gave gave covers when we asked. And these were covers for mimeographed books, 300 copies with staples. And um, I remember asking Philip Gustin for a cover. He sent six, six covers, possible covers for us to use. Um, where are these covers? And how much? Well, how talk, much, <laughs> talk, how much talk, talk about money. Then he'd say, "Keep them, sell them if you want." Sell to. them, do whatever. Um, and these covers would be worth thousands and thousands of dollars. And um, <laughs> well, we didn't. Um, oh, no, no, the covers were not stenciled. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we offset, offset, this thing called offset existed. So no, we'd have to take them. Um, the great thing about mimeographing was that we could Line do it cuts. all. We were in control of the, the process completely. What, what? The means of production. The means of production. Um, it, to the point where I finally bought my own mimeograph machine and had it in my living room and could do a book all night. And there it would appear the next morning. Um, it was so exciting. Um, but we had to send the covers out. Um, to some offset place, and um, um, they would come back. And they were reproduced very nicely. Um, no, I don't think so. Not yet. Um, I don't know. I'm not quite sure about the history of the copy shop. Um, <laughs> um, well, something to research as we as we go home tonight. But. Uh, I think we're about out of time, but I want to invite you to come out with us into the lobby and continue the conversation. Uh, books by all three poets are for sale. I want to thank them all for being here with us tonight and celebrating the artist book. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again to the Walker and to you all. We'll see you in just a moment.